actually, it's bo mostly a German name, but uh, I claim a French background because my relatives came from Alsace-Lorraine, which is part-time right, uh, okay. German, part-time French. Yeah. And, did uh, they come straight from there to here, or did they go through Canada? Or no, my, my parents came directly to the States. Uh, they were immigrants. I was a first-generation American. Where were you born? I was born in Akron, Ohio. And if you don't mind my asking, what year? 1924. Sweet spot of the beginning of the Depression. I guess you you grew up when the Depression hit, I guess. Yeah, well, the first first years were all right. My parents, they uh, immigrated, of course, for the to find the American dream, and they were doing quite well. Dad had a job as a machinist, and they'd bought a little house, and my mother was home raising three boys, and they were doing quite well in the 20s. And then the Depression hit, and my dad lost his job, and uh, that's when we had to move. And you would have been about five years old at that point? I had finished kindergarten, and I just started first grade. Okay, and then I'll just keep pulling that same string until we get somewhere. Where, where'd you move to? <laughs> well, we had to move. They had bought an old farm about 20 miles west of Akron, and uh, it was a dilapidated 42-acre farm. Uh -oh. We went there actually to survive and uh, the house was uh, leaning about 10 degrees to the west there was no plumbing no electricity nothing no not, no amenities at all had no loud house in the back that was propped up with a two before to keep it from assuming a horizontal position from the just way. times were rough but i guess we didn't realize how rough they were everybody else uh, they were all poor. We were poor, very poor. And uh, there were times when we didn't have 10 cents. I mean, didn't have 10 pennies in the house. Mm -hmm. There was one case when we had no Model T Ford in 1924, and my dad would load up sacks of corn and oats and take it down to the mill to grind for chicken feed or cattle feed. And it took 10 cents to get it ground. And uh, he loaded up the old Ford and he waited for the mailman to come because the milk check was due. And uh, it was about four or five dollars a month milk check is all it was. But uh, he saw the mailman stop at the mailbox so he cranked up the old Ford and took off, turned around and came back. The check was check. not in the mail. <laughs> and he had to unload everything because we didn't have 10 cents in the house. I keep saying uh, you can you can tell a product of the depression. That's the old timer who will pick up a penny in the Walmart parking lot. Right. That's but, uh, we yeah we managed to grow a, a garden, but in the winter time, of course, it was a little rougher. We always had eggs and uh, some milk. And my mother made bread, and there was one time I remember going to school when my luncheon was two pieces of bread, and that was it. Uh, All right. And like I say, everybody else was poor and times were rough, and uh, this was a, a farming community, which means you didn't live right next door to a neighbor, but within a radius of a mile or so from our farm, there were, I think, five suicides. And wow. Did, and uh, in my... In my class, it was a small school, there were 12 girls and 12 boys, and uh, three of them had parents commit suicide. Well, what, how, how'd you leave well the first adventure the was in going into the Army, okay. right out of high school. I graduated in 42, which was the first graduating class after war had started, okay. and uh, I wanted to enlist. 17 uh, when I graduated, but my parents wouldn't sign. My older brother was already in, in the service, but I waited until I was 18 and then I was drafted. They drafted you before you could? Yeah, well, I didn't realize it was quite real yet. That, that came a little later, but uh, yeah, I, my parents took me to the train station in a nearby town and, and uh, I was sworn in and we went to Fort Hayes, Columbus in Ohio. 
and there we were given shots and uh, our uniforms and I was pretty naive I didn't I wasn't familiar with the various branches of service and I had no choice really I was told you're in the army and they said not only in the army you're in the infantry and I said what's that he said well you carry a rifle and you shoot the enemy so that was just my introduction to the infantry <coughs> from there I went to Camp Shelby, Mississippi, where I got my basic training and then advanced training. And then I shipped out in uh, early March or so of 43, uh, of 44, I'm sorry. And went to England and uh, spent some time in replacement camps in England for about three weeks. And then went to Normandy. This was after D-Day. I got there after D-Day, but on Omaha Beach, but it was secure when I got there. And uh, again, I went through about three different replacement pools. And uh, finally, one afternoon in July, uh, actually it was the 25th of July, I was called in an apple orchard uh, with about seven or eight other men and uh, I was addressed by a second lieutenant, and if you don't mind, I'll use his exact words. He lined us up, called us to attention, and said, all right, you sons of bitches, you're going into combat. And he said, now look at that bastard on your right, and then take a good look at that one on your left, because in 24 hours, some of you bastards are gonna be dead. And that's when I realized that this was for real. <laughs> and we, uh, we marched out. Of course, you don't march out in formation. It was uh, single file, 20 paces behind the man behind you. And uh, we marched through St. Lo, which had just been heavily bombed that day. And uh, by nightfall, we reached our destination. I had no idea where I was, who I was with, anything total darkness, somebody took me by the hand and said, you're now in a scout in the 3rd Battalion, 120th Regiment of the 30th Infantry Division. So that was my introduction to my outfit, which was the 30th Division. 30th was a, a North Carolina Tennessee National Guard originally. And uh, they were named after Andrew Jackson. It was called the Old Hickory. And uh, uh, by the time the war ended, we had participated in all five campaigns. Uh, Normandy, Northern France, the Rhinelands, the Ardennes, the Battle of the Bulge, and Central Europe, what they called it. Uh, an observer, a scout and observer. Did you have to go in ahead of everybody else by not, yourself not or much, anything? No, I mean, it wasn't. Went on patrols occasionally. That's okay. About all. And I spoke French. My folks are French Swiss, and uh, that was my first language. So I was used as an interpreter. I would contact the French resistance and the, later on the Belgian resistance. But by the time we uh, met the Russians and the war was over. Our division has had more continuous combat days than any other division. We had more Congressional Medals of Honor than any other. We had a total of six. But this this came at a cost. Yeah, yeah. We we had uh, over seventeen thousand casualties, of which over three thousand eight hundred and fifty uh, were killed. But later on, of course, we we ran into civilians. And of course, we were we were always accepted. Uh, they, they always came out with the whatever they could provide. <laughs> we always had our canteens full of cider. Of course, <coughs> Normandy is cider country, apple country, so we, we always had plenty of cider. And uh, they didn't have much else to offer, except you might find a chicken once in a while and get an egg. That's about it. Wow. And so there's, there's, there's no there. such thing as a tent. So we were just. You, you're on the ground, you, you dig a hole or a foxhole or else you... I used to look for places I could get inside a, a barn or a, uh, someone's cellar or a 
slept in chicken coop one night. Wow. That was better than digging a hole, but uh, oh, certainly. <laughs> through Normandy until the, uh, actually the campaign ended the 25th of, uh, of uh, July when there was a saturation bombing of the front lines and we finally broke through for the hedgerow country. Okay. And uh, from then on it's called the, the Battle of Northern France. But we were still fighting in Normandy even though it was called the Battle of Northern France. And we, uh, we just kept liberating villages after one after another and moving across France. And, uh, and there was a, a famous battle that was fought yet, even though the Normandy campaign was over. It was a battle of Mortain, which is not very well colored in the history books. But it was a turning point in the war. Uh, if you want to uh, find out what was going on, the, uh, the British, you know, were supposed to take the city of Caen on D-Day from uh, their landing beach, which was, uh, which was called uh, Sword. And after six weeks, they still hadn't taken it. So they, uh, they finally decided, Montgomery decided to bomb the city. So he bombed the city in a beautiful old French city, and they, they leveled it. And what they didn't know was that the Germans, most of them, had fled the city anyhow. But they were fleeing in what was known as the Falaise Gap. And they were heading for Germany. They were trying to get away. But Hitler wanted another counterattack. So he got four panzer divisions, which are armored divisions and some infantry, and tried another attack. And he had to go through a little village called Mortain and our division was at Mortan. And we occupied the highest position east of the town, overlooking the area from which the attack was coming. And basically, one company of 150 men, roughly, stopped this whole counterattack of four Panzer divisions. Panzer? They stopped that and it took six days. They were almost all wiped out. But from this vantage point, we were able to call I wasn't there, but we were able to call in uh, artillery. We had a forward observer, and that's what stopped the attack. Right. And uh, well, if the it. German general in charge, von Klug, told Hitler he just couldn't get past those troops on Hill 314. That was 314 meters above sea level. And he said, we have to retreat. And uh, he committed suicide. But from there, we, we moved across to France quite rapidly. And we ended up north of Paris on, uh, in September, September the 1st. And uh, <laughs> Captain Pritchard, he was our S2, our intelligence officer. He came to me, it was the afternoon of September the 1st. And he said, come on, Schneider, we're going to Belgium. And I said, Belgium, that's over 100 miles from here. He says, yeah, but we're going to Belgium. Well, you had to understand Captain Pritchard. He, he, he used to get me into more problems because he'd select me to go on his patrols. And he and I liberated one town all by ourselves <laughs> one time by accident. We didn't mean to. So anyhow, the plan was for three divisions to move simultaneously toward Belgium. We were in the middle, the 28th Division on one flank and the 2nd Armored on the other. And each division uh, had a task force leading us. And uh, it was quite sizable, there were no tanks, but we had scout cars and, and infantry. And uh, we were not selected to be in this task force. But Captain Pritchard was not to be denied this wonderful opportunity to share that with me and yeah. also with his friend Captain Hill, who was our S3 or operations officer. So the three of us commandeered this jeep and we joined this forward uh, task force. And we took off, it was probably the middle of the afternoon, almost late afternoon. And by evening, we were almost halfway to Belgium already, getting very little resistance. And then on the second day, on the s September the 2nd, the forward elements of the, 
this task force, which is probably our recon troop, crossed into Belgium at 6.30 in the afternoon. So that, that made us the first American division into Belgium. And the, the th our little trio crossed a couple hours later, and we were in total darkness, wandering on our own. We were strictly on our own from there on. We had no idea where we were or what we were doing. But Captain Pritchard wanted to get on our objective, which he knew was the Brussels Tournay Highway, which was uh, actually, we, we went to the city of Antoin, which was about eight kilometers in from the border. And from there, we tried to get our bearing, which uh, would put us on our objective in about three and a half or four kilometers. So we took off, we were in the Jeep. Yeah, okay, the three all right. So we took off <coughs> in a northerly direction. We were paralleling a, uh, a canal and it was full moon, but it had been raining and it was cloudy, but the full moon would pop out occasionally and uh, we could get our bearings. And we're moving along this canal, and all at once we heard a vehicle coming toward us. And we stopped. I jumped out the right side, and uh, Captain Hill was sitting behind the 30 caliber machine gun we had. He pulled back the boat. And I hauled at this vehicle, and they started talking to me in, in French. And I stopped Captain Hill just in time. He was ready to open fire on. He didn't know uh, that they were from Belgium. But it turned out it was uh, Belgian resistance, or what they called l'armée blanche. That was their resistance. And uh, they wondered what we were doing there. Oh, well, I guess. <laughs> we told them we were trying to get to the Brussels Tournay Highway. Well, you're on the wrong road. The Germans are right up the road here. We ran into them. You better turn around and go back. So they had a cash. This was a beat up old truck. I had a canvas cover on it. In fact, I have a picture of it. And uh, I, they opened up the back end. They showed me a casualty they had back there, and they were trying to get back to the town of Antoin to get some uh, medical attention. So they told us to go back to Antoin, and you got to cross the canal. And uh, so we did. We turned around, went back, and as we got into Antoin, we saw the the uh, drawbridge across the canal. So we pulled up there, and of course the drawbridge was raised so we couldn't get across. And we were challenged, and I told them who we were, and there was the rattling of chains, and the bridge came down, and we rode across. It wasn't a large bridge. And on the other side, there was another member of the White Army, and uh, we told him what we were looking for as to the highway or the road that would take us to the, our objective, and uh, he said, "Well, you're right behind some uh, some of your own troops." And well, he described them, and it was, turned out it was our recon troop. They had a scout car, I think three jeeps, and that was it. And uh, so he sat on the fender of the jeep and said, um, "We drove a few yards, and we came to a traffic circle." And he said. He got us on the right road, and he said it'll be about three and a half, four kilometers from here. So we took off, and when we were almost on our objective, there was a little bend in the road, and it had cut through some a hill. So there was a mound of dirt on each side of the of the road, and we stopped there. And just as we stopped, this shooting started. Uh, coming down the main road, tracers were coming down the road. We abandoned the jeep and ran toward this mound of dirt, and the tracers were flying overhead and on both sides of us. And then there were a couple of bad explosions, and the whole sky lit up. And the Germans had knocked out two of the jeeps and the scout car, and they had killed three of the uh, recon troops. Seriously. And the Germans were sitting right on our objective, yeah. our main yeah. objective. So uh, things calmed down after, uh, actually, it was only the crackling of the small arms burning in the fire, and uh, it got quiet. 
So we made it back to the Jeep and, and physically turned it around without starting the motor. <laughs> we had a couple bullet holes in it and we, we headed back toward town and we uh, met this same person who was at the drawbridge and uh, he insisted we spend the night in his home, which was common. They always wanted you to spend the time okay. in their homes. So he, uh, we did, and by then the whole battalion had caught up with us, and the railroad station was right across the street, and we housed the whole battalion in that radio station, I mean, um, railroad station. Railroad station. Housed them for the night, and uh, there's a military historian who uh, found out I had written an article on first night in Belgium, and he was writing his account. So he researched what I had written, and he confirmed the authenticity of it, <laughs> and he's included this in his book. But uh, in his research, he was able to find who that man was in the back of that truck. Really? Yeah, and he corresponded with me. He thanked me for not shooting him up that night because he'd already been shot up once that I night. I must say, everybody was lucky that night. Yeah. That's a... And uh, he was still, he, he was, uh, he had recovered. He had to take, they had to take him all the way back to London, though, to recover. And he came back and was a farmer outside of town. And uh, so these, uh, some of these researchers, it's unbelievable what they do. You can go back and uh, they'll find your old foxhole for you sometime. But, uh, Have you been back over there? Oh, several times, yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah, I've been back several times. Uh, fortunately, I, I worked out of London for four years, so I was oh, able so to get to... it was to almost a day trip in a sense. Yeah, yeah. so I was able to but go to... I'm a little curious about the... Uh, this Captain Pritchard and his motivations, was he just a John Wayne type or yeah, a he, mischievous he, type? Well, he liked, to, he liked to, to think he was kind of John Wayne. Okay, so he, and, and then when you're out there, who, how do you communicate? Is it find what you can to eat, shoot what looks yeah. like a bad guy? Yeah, or, well, you always had rations. And you're just a young man at this point, right? Yeah, I, I, mean, was, I was 19 then, yeah. So you're thinking clearly, I, I bet I don't want to put you down, but you weren't too smart at 19, were you? <laughs> or how smart were you? I, 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 yeah. I was in Vietnam at 21, and I cried the whole time. I could never have gone through what you just described. Uh, it's just insane. Yeah, yeah. yeah well, Barbara Ann, uh, when she was editing my book, she kept asking, how could you do these things? Didn't you wait for orders? I said, no, we didn't wait for orders. You saw something that had to be done, and, and you did it. Like uh, uh, the, the three of us taken off with this task force, we had no orders to do that. I can only imagine what they'd do to you in this today's army if you tried oh, that. Oh, if you tried that, it would yeah. be over. But uh, I think that's one reason the Americans beat the Germans. The Germans had to do everything by the book. Yeah, and of course you know that on D-Day, if uh, they operated the way we did, we'd been pushed back into the English Channel. But, you know, they had these tanks in reserve, and no one would wake up Hitler to get <laughs> orders to release right? those tanks. And, of course, that delayed them several days. By then, we got we were able to get on the, on the shore. So how did you get to Normandy? Did you come on one of the troop boats? As a troop boat, down and said we, went, we went down the ladder onto a little landing boat. And okay. And, uh, but the beach had been secured by oh then? Oh, yeah, it had been secured okay. by then. And then, now we were in Belgium. What happens after Belgium? After Belgium, we, we, well, we moved across Belgium and we got to the Dutch border at a, a, a place called Fort Ebene Mall. It was the largest inland fort in Europe. It was in Belgium. It was on the Albert Canal, which, which parallels the, uh, the Moss River. And uh, uh, the Netherlands is on the other side of the Moss. And we captured this from the Germans. Uh, with very few casualties, that, because all of the uh, all of the armament was facing to the east, because it was built as protection against uh, an invasion from Germany. Mm -hmm. But we came from the west and captured this large fort, and I I went in the fort and I got a large flag 
Nazi flag, which my son has now. And if you stood up there on the balcony, it would come all the way to the floor. It's oh, really? It's a monstrous Big flag. Dude. Anyhow, uh, after we captured the fort, we crossed into the Netherlands, and we were the we liberated the first major city in the Netherlands, which was Maastricht. And uh, Maastricht is in Limburg province, right up against Germany. It's not that far. And uh, I never realized this, but even though we liberated them in the middle of September, the coastal cities like. Amsterdam and Rotterdam and The Hague, they weren't liberated until March, six months later. And in the meantime, the, the people had been starving, the Germans were starving, oh, sure. the Dutch. But uh, even though that was way to the west on the coast, we were way on the east when we liberated Maastricht. After Maastricht, we liberated uh, most of Limburg province, which brought us right up against the German border, and we uh, then uh, prepared to cross the Siegfried Line, which we did, and uh, we, I was in Germany by October the 1st, and we could never tell what we were doing in any letters we wrote. We could only say somewhere in and name the country. So my birthday was October the 4th and I was, I was uh, still 19. So I sat down real quick and wrote somewhere in Germany so I could, so I could uh, verify that I was in Germany and been all the way across France, Belgium and the Netherlands before I was 20 years old. And then of course this was 44 and then the presidential election was one month later. And I wasn't allowed to vote because I wasn't 21. Oh really? Okay. Voting I didn't realize eighteen. Okay. Yeah. So this is this is the area where we were in most of uh, November, uh, capturing the little German villages mostly, and then uh, that's where we were on the sixteenth of December when the Battle of the Bulge started, and we were supposed to be pulled back into the Netherlands for a rest period, and we went back to the Netherlands. And before we could be assigned to some private homes where we could get a maybe a hot meal and, and a rest, they said, uh, we're moving out. Something big has happened south of here. So we were, we were given a bottle of warm Coca-Cola. And in spite of what you hear on TV, they say that all oh, the Americans always had Coca-Cola everywhere they went. Well, <laughs> that is the only bottle I ever got during combat. And it was warm. So we, we boarded trucks and started to move south. And our objective was to move until we hit the Germans. And uh, that's all we knew. And we stopped. Uh, when it got dark, we stopped, tried to get a little rest, and then took off again in the, in the morning. And by late afternoon uh, of the must have been the 17th by then. Uh, we were at the outskirts of the city of Malmedy. Uh, Malmedy uh, has a place in history because of the Malmedy Massacre, which I'll tell you about later. But we moved into Malmedy as fast as we could, and the Germans were on the south side. We could actually see them, and we beat them by minutes in the Malmedy. Of course, they wanted they wanted to capture Malmedy, so for the next six days, uh, they kept attacking all along the north boundary. And incidentally, the Battle of the Bulge was not the Battle of Bastogne. Now, I get tired of hearing uh, it's always Battle of Bastogne. That's all they talk about. But the major thrust was on the north flank of the Bulge because they wanted to go to Liège, which was to the northwest, and we had a large uh, munitions depot there, had all kinds of supplies, and the Germans were going to resupply their troops and then move on to Antwerp, which was our biggest port for bringing in supplies for uh, all of Europe. And so the, most of the 
thrusts to the northwest were all of them. That's where they concentrated all their panzers. But anyhow, uh, when the bulge started, we weren't the only division that moved south. We moved several divisions from the First Army to bolster that north flank. And every time the Germans would try to break through, there'd be someone there to stop them. And this went on for six days, and it was strictly a ground battle because we couldn't get any air support because of the overcast skies and uh, were you doing all this with an M16 in the helmet, or what, what, what kind of armaments did you have? I had an M1. M1, yeah, M16, okay, yeah. M1. And uh, uh, so, anyhow, after after six days, the skies cleared, and it was, they were crystal clear, and the Air Force could come out. Of course, this is when the Air Force uh, dropped supplies to the 101st Airborne in Bastogne, and. Mm -hmm. And then Patton came up from the south and rescued them. But up on the north, uh, they were going to help us too. So on the 20, uh, 23rd of, of uh, December, they came over and bombed the center of Malmody, and we were sitting in Malmody, our own planes. And so we tried to communicate with them. They wouldn't listen. They said, We know. It's in German hands. We said, no, we're sitting here. No, our intelligence says it's in German hands. So we couldn't convince them that we were in Malmody. So on the 24th, they came over again, this time with P-24s, uh, four-engine liberators. And I was in the center of town speaking to a friend when we heard the rumble of the planes coming. He said, I'm getting the hell out of here. I said, me too. He went one direction, I went the other, and I got about a block away to a schoolhouse and made it to the basement when the bombs were falling. And uh, to this day, this friend of mine has never been found. He's still carried as missing. See, that's so right. He got a direct hit, apparently. But in the bombing, they missed a school and a little hospital next to it and a chapel. And most of the rest of the city was hit. But uh, then on Christmas Day, they came over again. And that was a, that's another story. That, uh, I helped some civilians. The Americans came over again. Oh, oh yeah, three days in a row they bombed us. Uh, our division in the war was bombed fourteen times by our own air force, and the, the worst was at uh, Saint Lo, <coughs> where we had six hundred and eighty-one casualties from our own air force. Wow. When they, when I they, knew it happened, but 681 casualties? Well, like I say, we were in Normandy, we, we were in this hedgerow country, which was very slow fighting, and we had to break out. So the top brass decided they would try high altitude saturation bombing in the front lines. This would decimate the Germans, and then we could move right off. Well, that was a plan. Well, the plan was uh, on the 24th of July they came over and some of the bombs fell short on mostly on our division killed several of our people and so they scratched the mission but then on the 25th they came over again and this time the same thing happened and uh, General McNair, Leslie McNair who was with my division or what with my battalion at the time and he wanted to witness this from the front and he was killed by our own Air Force. And they never found him, they just found his helmet. But uh, in these two days of bombing, we lost, we had 681 casualties. They weren't all killed, but mostly some well, of them. Still, we, we had still had about 60 killed directly, and another 50 or 60 were blown to pieces, never found, and the rest were wounded. And uh, of course, that was, a, that was the worst of the of the 14 bombing attacks. But the, the bombing was uh, was not carried out the way it was supposed to. They were The planes were supposed to come over from England parallel to the front line. But the Air Force decided, well, it's going to subject them to German anti-aircraft if they came in parallel. Mm -hmm. So they came in from behind us, and of course that... And stopped short, uh, and... Uh, that made the bombs fell, fall a little short. 
But anyhow, uh, after we were bombed at Malmody, uh, we started, we went on the offensive, and we started moving out and about three or four kilometers south of Malmody, we ran into the site of the Malmody Massacre. Now, uh, on the first day of the breakthrough by the Germans, they captured a, a forward observer, a, uh, an artillery forward observer battalion. And uh, they herded them into a field which we called, we call it Five Points. It's a little village called Bozhne, but they call it the Malmody Massacre, but it was in Bozhne. And then they proceeded to machine gun them. And uh, there were some that escaped. I knew two of them. We had two of them in our organization, the Battle of the Bulge organization that I was, I was president of. And uh, so the word was, there had been this massacre, but it wasn't until we discovered the bodies one month later, and they were still there. So frozen. you came up on your, you came up on the bodies. This yes. is, this was in, this was on the 16th of January, mm -hmm. and the bulge started the 16th. The massacre was on the 16th or 17th. So they'd been there a whole month, frozen solid. And you're a 20-year-old young man at this point. Yeah, well, I'm not the one that discovered him, but I no, saw but you're, him. No, but you're, you're walking up on this stuff. You're in the, you're in the zone with us. Yeah, I, uh, I saw the bodies out there. Yeah, uh, they yeah. were all covered with snow, mostly, and uh, uh, the total turned out to be 86 killed. I see various numbers reported, but I've been back several times to the site. There's a monument there with the stone wall with brass plaques of all those killed and, uh -huh. and I've taken uh, my grandchildren over there and uh, I've been there several times and I've had them count the plaques so we always come up with 86 and uh, well, somebody didn't want to be mentioned I guess when you were going through all this stuff it happened pretty quickly did you travel with the same company or the same well, I was with the, the same, same 20 guys 30 yeah. guys whatever so you got to know these people pretty well well actually actually uh most of the one most of my friends were well we had a the intelligence section there were only about four or five of us in that and uh and then in uh in november I was reassigned to uh, Message Center, and in Message Center, we would run messages to the rifle companies from battalion headquarters, and each each uh, company had two runners, so there was I, K, L, and M, the four rifle companies in our, well, three rifle companies and heavy weapons in our battalion. So I got to know these these uh, company runners, mm -hmm. and so they were my best friends. And of those, I company, I remember all their names too, Kenny Bedford and Pete and Perez, they survived. K company, uh, one fellow, we just called him Thomas, I don't even know who he was, he got killed. Uh, L company, uh, one of the runners was with me when I got wounded, and he got killed. And the other runner got captured by the Germans in the bulge. And then in M Company, one of those was severely wounded. So that was what most of my close friends uh, went through. But, uh, yeah. Uh, but after the uh, bulge then, we moved back to our old stomping grounds up in Germany and, and the Netherlands and prepared to cross the uh, Rhine River. And uh, by then, the assistant battalion commander, Captain Christie, had had three drivers shot out from under him. <laughs> so they asked if I would drive for him. I said, yeah, I'll drive for him. And I barely knew him. I'd only known him for two or three days when we crossed the Rhine. We crossed uh, 
after heavy artillery barrage, and, and we crossed in a little, I guess they called it an alligator. It was like a hollowed out tank. It could hold one Jeep, and that was it. And uh, the engineers were starting to build the pontoon bridge when we crossed the morning of the 24th uh, of March. And we got to the other side and we moved about eight kilometers inland from Germany. We set up headquarters in a little village. And uh, if I had some notes, I'd know the name, but, but it's a, <laughs> a small village. And a friend of mine was standing guard in this, we'd taken over a brick house for our battalion headquarters. And this friend of mine, a farm boy from uh, Mount Horrible, Wisconsin. He was standing guard there, and he, I was talking to him, and he uh, gave me a letter. He said, would you mail this letter for me? It's a letter to my mother. I said, well, you can get it mailed as well as I can. He said, no, I'd feel better if you took it. So I didn't argue with him. I took the letter, put it in my jacket pocket, and about then, about a dozen German prisoners were being herded into a church next door. I said, I'm going to go help search these guys. Maybe I can get a watch or something from them. You know? So I went in there, and by the time I got in the church, the Germans laid a heavy mortar barrage on us. And uh, after that was over, I walked out back to the, this brick house, and Jack wasn't there. Yeah. I said, uh, where's Jack? I don't know. I, he got hit by that mortar barrage, I believe. So I went down in the cellar, and there he was, covered with the GI blankets, still warm, mm -hmm. but very dead. And I'd been talking to him fewer than 15 minutes ago. Well, you must feel understand like this, but the longer you're in uh, combat, and of course I, I wasn't in a rifle company. Those, those are the ones that took the beating, you know. But you still realize that the longer you're in, the shorter your chances of surviving. So you hope you're going to get hit with a million dollar wound. And what's a million dollar <laughs> wound? That's, that's a wound where you won't lose a limb or you won't be blinded, you won't have a head wound. But it'll be a good flesh wound, maybe a nice piece of shrapnel in your rear end, you know, it'll give you about six inch gap or something. It's going to take forever to heal. That's enough to get you back into the rear or maybe even get you home. You so that was a million dollar wound. But I, I didn't get a million dollar wound. Uh, but anyhow, uh, that's what you hope for. And uh, when I got wounded, the, my comrades thought it was a million dollar wound, but I showed up again. So, so where, where were you wounded? What? At what point? Because it's now March 15th. Well, when we, uh, the next day after, after my friend Jack had been killed, the next day uh, we, we broke through the German line and uh, this Captain Christie asked me to go back and direct the rest of our battalion through this opening that we made in the line. And he said, take one of the runners with you. So he took one a friend of mine. Uh, uh, Storm, Grouse Storm, from L Company, and then he said, never mind, I'll go along too. So he gets in the driver's seat, I mean the passenger seat, and this friend of mine sat over the right rear wheel, and we took off down this gravel road, and we radioed for tanks, and the first tank came by, kicking up a lot of dust to the gravel road, and I gave way to the right, he gave way to the left. The second tank came by, and we were almost parallel when he hit a mine with his left track right alongside of it. And uh, it didn't blow the track off, he just kept moving. But before I could stop, I detonated one with my right rear wheel, and uh, it blew Captain Christie straight ahead, killed him outright. And this friend of mine had his right leg blown off all the way up to the hip and uh, he was still conscious he landed in the road about 25 feet from the wreckage i was blown up over the steering wheel and landed right behind this tank 
that would come by. If I'd have hit the mine two or three seconds earlier, I'd have been blown right in front of this tank, run over by home tank maybe. So anyhow, uh, both of those were killed then, and uh, I survived, of course, and uh, went to a went to the hospital for a short stay, and they uh, finally said I'd have to get out because I was ambulatory. Well, uh, I could move, that's about all. I was sore. Uh, when you say get out, they mean get out of the hospital. Get out of the hospital. Yeah. And you can't get out of the service, you can't oh, go no, home. No. They didn't but give you that option. They didn't seem to care what happened to me. They just said you can either go back through a replacement pool and get reassigned, or you can find your own way back to your outfit. Damn. So, yeah. So, get out of here. So I walked out, it was getting dark by then. Uh, it was just a tent hospital, probably something like a mash unit, I suppose. And I recognized one of our ambulances had just come in with some casualties. And, and uh, I knew the driver. And I said, you going back to the battalion? He said, yeah, you want a ride? Said, yeah, give me a ride. Wow. So he brought me back to the battalion. Everybody was surprised to see me because, like I said, they, they'd heard I had a million dollars. So this was, of course, March. This was in March, and uh, this was only about a month before the war was over. So from then on, as we moved across Germany, I got limited duty. So uh, all I had to do was kind of tag along. Mm -hmm. And uh, my friends took care of me. They would get my rations for me and made sure I, was, I had a safe place every night. So uh, this went on until we uh, met the Russians at a city called Magdeburg, which was on the Elbe River. The, the plan was for the Russians to stop at the Elbe, and we would also stop at the Elbe. And there's a, a funny story, uh, I keep saying it's a, a funny story to a not very funny war, but uh, a second lieutenant came to me. I, I don't know why he picked me, but he said, go with this driver and uh, pick up some German prisoners that are coming across the Elbe River to escape the Russians. And we had this two and a half ton truck, driver and I, and uh, I left my M1 and, and borrowed a Tommy gun, and he had a 45, and we had a 50 caliber in the tour. We took off with this two and a half ton truck, and we get to the boundary of uh, the levee, and these Germans, all a bunch of young Germans, sitting there on the levee, and they all jumped up. We didn't even <laughs> search them. They jumped into the truck, and I told the driver, I said, okay, let's take them to the prisoner of war camp. He said, where is it? I said, I don't know. He said, you were supposed to know. I said, I, I thought you knew. <clears throat> so neither of us knew where to take them. So one of the young Germans recognized we were in a dilemma, and he spoke a little English. So he said, I know where it is, I'll direct you. <laughs> so the Germans you captured <laughs> yeah, directed you to how to turn them in. Right, he directed us to the prisoner of war camp. So we we took, uh, it was a warehouse on our side of the Elbe, and we deposited our prisoners, and the MPs gave us a receipt for X number of prisoners, and the mission was accomplished. But that's not the end of the story. When I was working in London uh, for Texaco, and we had bought a German uh, producing company, oil producing, and to appease the Germans, we built a research lab in a little village called Vizi. And I was asked to go visit this research lab, and uh, I was able to take my wife with me, and we, so we made a trip across the channel to Hamburg, where we had an office, and for there, from there we were directed to this research lab, and I was introduced to all of the professors there. The, they were all hair doctor professor, you know. And uh, they took me to a, a young paleontologist. He was uh, checking well cuttings for foraminifera. And he was sitting at the table looking at them through a microscope. And they had told them that I had fought them during the war. And uh, he looked up and he said, uh, doing paleontology much more fun than fighting the war, right? 
I said, how would you know? You were too young. He said, no, I, I was 15 years old living in Magdeburg. And, uh. Uh, and uh, he said, uh, all my friends and I were conscripted. We were given a rifle and a uniform, and we were told to defend Magdeburg at all costs. So he said the Russians were coming. We weren't about to defend Magdeburg at all costs. So we made our way across the Elbe, and we waited to be captured by the <laughs> Americans. And then I, I told him my story, and he jumped up and said, You're the one who captured me. Was, Dr. Plumhoff was his name by then. Wow. Uh, giving me his life. Incidentally, uh, the, the medics must have found that letter on me in my jacket pocket because it was mailed and uh, after the war I made contact with his family and they had received that last letter mm -hmm. that he wrote. Well, you know, he knew, he knew, but he knew. Yeah, you hear these stories about people having a premonition, but I never did have any, uh, but yeah, some did.